Blessed people, I just want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit of the Lord today. I wanted to look at the role of the Holy Spirit, and I thought we could spend this time exploring a little bit uh, on the Holy Spirit, He that is very, very important to the Church, and the role of the Holy Spirit in your Christian salvation, especially at this time when there is a humongous visitation, the latter visitation of the Holy Spirit, of the glory of God is taking place in the church. So there is no better time at which now to even delve deeper, to go deeper, to dig deeper into understanding the time, and most importantly, the visitation of the Holy Spirit and his role in the church, why he is visiting the church. Now, right away from the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 33, John chapter 1, verse 33, he says, and now I read from NIV, and I myself did not know him but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Again, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, that means the Father, God the Father, told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so this is very powerful because he's saying that right from the beginning, right from the onset, you can clearly see that the Holy Spirit, when he was sent to the church, we know very clearly that he brought Christ Jesus the Messiah and he incarnated Christ Jesus the Messiah. He brought him, in other words, in human form, God become man to come and deliver man. He came down here as a stranger, as a sojourner, to be able in that short time here to deliver mankind, to save mankind. And so he became the savior of all men. And then we're also aware that uh, the church, when it was now time to birth out the church, after the Lord Jesus Christ had completed the beautiful, triumphant work on the cross and achieved victory, attained victory, and he took victory, victory over sin and death, and then he ascended on high. So when it was now time to bath out the church, he told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come. And so, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit does descend, when the Holy Spirit descends, the book of Acts chapter 2, when he descends, then he is able for the first time to birth out the church. So the church was birthed out by the Holy Spirit from on high. So the church is heavenly. The church is built from heaven. The Messiah that came to deliver the church came from heaven. And after he completed his work, when it was time now for the church to be birthed out, the church to be inaugurated, then you hear chapter 2 of the book of Acts, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven 
and filled the whole house where they were sitting. He says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Verse 4, the book of Acts chapter 2, he says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So you understand, enabled them, prompted them, caused them to speak. Not that they started on their own, they effect what? No, as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 5. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation and uh, the heaven. And he says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, verse 7, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Persians, Medes, and Alamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. He says, Egypt and the parts of Libya. Then he says, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts from Judaism. Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much to drink. Then Peter stood up, verse 14, with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. That's the first inaugural speech right there. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy, I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, billows of smoke, all the way down. But what am I saying here? The reason I bring you that scripture in the book of Acts chapter 2 is to make you understand that right from the beginning, the role of the Holy Spirit is that, number one, he brought Christ the Messiah. The Holy Spirit is the one who incarnated Christ the Messiah. And he brought Christ the Messiah in the human form. God become man so that he may come and deliver the church, deliver humanity. But now you see the role that he plays upon the triumphant resurrection of Christ the Messiah, where now the church is to be birthed out, the Holy Spirit is the one that came and birthed out the church. So, the second role of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to run through the different purposes, services, different jurisdictions that the Holy Spirit holds, and then I'll narrow down to one of them. So we can get a little deeper. So you see that he brought us Christ at Bethlehem. And then now it's time to birth out the church. The church now to be birthed out, inaugurated. You see that the church was designed in heaven. And the savior of the church came from heaven and went back to heaven upon accomplishing of his task. Once he successfully defeated death, and locks the gates of hell and hate. 
he goes back to heaven. So the design, the plan for the redemption of man always takes place in heaven. It's always designed in heaven. Even this second rescue, you can all see that is designed from heaven. This second deliverance that is taking place now to restore the church, that she may not miss the glorious eternity Jesus purchased for her at the Calvary cross. But number two, you see that when it's time now to birth out the church, the Holy Spirit has to come. He says in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, Do not leave Jerusalem until power has come to you from on high. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. He says, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Advocate has come, the Holy Spirit has come. Again, the book of Acts chapter 1 from verse 3. After suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Very powerful. He spoke to them about the glorious kingdom of God. The work he had just accomplished in purchasing men for. Verse 4, it says, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So you see, even the church, at the time before the Holy Spirit has arrived, he told the disciples that, look, you cannot go and execute the commission of the church, the mission of the church, the purpose of the church. You will only do so when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And when the Holy Spirit comes, as we see now in the book of Acts chapter 2, we've just read, then you see that now Peter is able to stand up and evangelize Jesus. And more than 3,000 at that time were converted. The first harvest, the first souls that turned into Christ came to the Lord. So the second role, like I said, is that the Holy Spirit designed from heaven the design of the church and came and burst out the church. So the church was actually created in heaven and the Lord simply lowered the plan to mankind here. He lowered the agenda, the agenda of heaven, placed it in the church, but it was designed in heaven. And I say it even now when you look at the second mission that is going on by he that speaks with you now, you can see that there is a tight command from heaven you can see that the Lord lowers them, you capture on camera from heaven, meaning this entire mission is designed and controlled. The mission control is in heaven. The agenda is now deposited in the church to be able to help humanity not to miss the eternal glorious kingdom of the Messiah. So the second role, as we've seen, is now to be able to bath out the church in the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, the third purpose, the third function of the Holy Spirit, his role in the church, the Lord Jesus says in the book of John chapter 14, verse 18, he comes as a comforter, a peace bringer. He brings peace. John chapter 14, John 14, blessed people, he brings peace. Now, John chapter 14, if you go down to verse 18, it says the following. I will not leave you as often. I'll come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, I'm alive. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. So what does he say here? He says, he is not going to leave them often, to leave the church often. He is not going to leave the church alone without care. But he would send the Holy Spirit as a comforter and to bring peace to the church, to their hearts. The fourth role of the Holy Spirit, still on same John 14, verse 27, you can see. Verse 27, he says, Peace, I leave with you, my 
peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So in 27 you see, when he said you will leave a comforter, then in verse 27 he says that comforter becomes your peace. My peace I leave with you. So the Holy Spirit comforts the church. And the fourth role that he brings peace to the church. When you look at verse 26, you still see other functions of the Holy Spirit in the church. His mandate, his jurisdiction and mission to the church. So verse 26, the mission of the Holy Spirit, he says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. That is very powerful. In other words, we remember John chapter 133 I read when he said, I myself did not know him except that he who sent me to baptize with water, meaning God the Father, meaning I come from the throne of God, I come from God the Father, I come from God, and he told me that the one on whom you see the Spirit descends, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, a white dove, a huge white dove, at the Jordan River, and remains, meaning light on him, meaning settle on him, meaning overshadow him, cover him, that is the one that will baptize with fire, with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the Holy Spirit was then able to identify Jesus. So the Holy Spirit revealed the Lord. And here in verse 26, you see very clearly says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I say to you, meaning he's saying that the Holy Spirit has a role of teaching. He has a teaching role, a teaching job in the church. He is the one who teaches the church. And then he says, the Holy Spirit, another function, is the one who reveals God to the church. Like in John 1, 33, he revealed Christ the Messiah. We see also here that he reveals the Lord Jesus to the church. At this point in time, he is going to reveal who Jesus is. He is going to reveal the holiness of the Christ, the holiness of Jesus. He is going to reveal to the church, in other words, he was saying, as he leaves, the Holy Spirit will reveal more and more of Christ to the church, that the followers of Christ, that the nations of the earth may follow Christ and may follow him rightfully, obediently, in the right manner. So, in order to reveal God to the church, the Holy Spirit normally works in the heart, in the hearts of men. And there in the hearts of men, you work on your belief that you may believe. He works on your belief. That is how the Holy Spirit reveals God to the church. He works on your belief that you may believe Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior and that God the Father in heaven is one God in triunity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit himself the one that you see on that January 1st, 2009, came and lighted on me. He that speaks with you today. And remember, that only happened to the Messiah. Has not happened since eternity and will never happen until eternity to anybody else. Only happened to the Messiah and he that speaks with you. Only these two. By God's design. Also, to identify them again. So that role of revealing, the Holy Spirit is the revealer. He reveals the agenda of God. He reveals the missions of God. So he reveals the Christ. And this time around, he has revealed 
the one that speaks with you here, that finally he has come. So, but look at this now. For the Holy Spirit to do his duty, the teaching job in the church that we see in John chapter 14, verse 26, to reveal more and more of Christ to the church after the Messiah has left and is seated on the right hand side of the Father. Then, the Holy Spirit, like I said, works in the heart. His work is centered in the heart, nowhere else. In the hearts of men. I know that he that speaks with you operates with him and brings judgment to the nations. Brings his judgment to the nations. I've told you many times that many times, actually not once, he comes the white, glorious, huge, like a dove, comes all the way from heaven. But if you look at his feet, he is carrying a cup, a white, glorious cup that's full. Normally it comes up to close some few kilometers above the earth, then he pours that cup. So he also has another role to execute judgment. And I don't want us to share that now, because right now we are in this moment when his role is to prepare the bride. And so the teaching job of the Holy Spirit to reveal more and more of Christ to the church, in other words, to reveal God to the church, he works on the belief of the church. Then after that, he works on the faith. He makes you now have faith. He makes you believe and then have faith. Faith in the church. That is the way he reveals more and more of Christ. That he may now affect your belief and affect your faith and affect your obedience to Christ Jesus and the laws he left here. Love one another. The commission he gave that you may obey him when he says, be holy, for without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. So that you may obey. Again, he affects the belief that you may believe. And then after that, he increases your faith. He affects your faith, the faith of the church, the faith of the believer. The third thing he teaches, the third way he does his teaching ministry, is that he now affects the obedience. Once you have had faith, then there are things to obey. There are rules that govern the grace of faith. This grace of faith we have. This grace that we have. Then obedience, that you may obey, that you may be righteous, that you may be holy, that you may shun sin. And the fourth thing he does, he affects holiness. He draws your heart closer to holiness. Why? Because he reveals to you that, look, Christ the Messiah is holy. Look, God the Father who sent him is very holy. He is holy. Christ is very holy. He is holy. And he said, look, the Holy Spirit is very holy. He is holy. So he affects the holiness of the church. He teaches the church belief. He teaches faith. teaches obedience. And now we see that he affects also holiness of the church. You see the ultimate. He's coming to the ultimate. He affects the righteousness of the church. And when you read the book of John chapter 16, verse 8, you see another role of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 8, he says, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Again, verse 8 of the book of John 16, he says, When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Three things. Verse 9, he says, About sin because people do not believe in me. Number 10, he says, About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Number 11, about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands judged, stands condemned. And so now, your seventh role or so, you see the Holy Spirit coming as a counselor. He now comes as a counselor, and he does convict of sin. Now he convicts man of sin. 
which is very powerful. How does he do so? And I'm going to focus on this tonight. Once I go through some of the other roles of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to come back and focus on John chapter 16, on the Holy Spirit, the counselor. The Holy Spirit, his convicting ministry. How he convicts men of sin. And you will see when we come back to this, when we get deeper, you see that the purpose of convicting men to sin, he does it by making you aware of sin. He brings a great awareness, his ministry, in convicting the church, convicting men of sin, is to bring a greater awareness of sin, that you may know that this is sin, and this other side is righteous. This is sin and wicked. This other side is righteous and holy. And then in the process, his objective is to lead, to lead mankind to repentance. We are going to see that shortly, because this is the role that I'm going to go deeper on tonight. I'm going to teach a little deeper now on the role of the Holy Spirit in convicting man of sin. Now, other roles of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Before we come back to conviction, to sin. It says here, verse 26, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Verse 27, it says, And he who searches our hearts, not the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so, in other words, you may take this as a separate uh, role of the Holy Spirit, or you may combine this with the sensitization, with this convicting of sin. He says, he makes the church sensitive to sin, so that they may stop sinning and repent. And if you read Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 23, it says, he brings fruits to the church, the fruits of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now, according to Galatians 5, you see that he brings gifts to the church. He himself is the greatest gift that Christ the Messiah talked about all the time during his public ministry here on the earth. And so now you see that he is the greatest gift to the church. My father would send you the gift. He is the greatest gift ever to be received. And he works on the hearts of men, all mankind. And then, if you read Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 on, you see that he also has another ministry. He has another duty to restrain the dominion of darkness. And so, he is the helper. He seals the believer for eternal life. That's another function. He reveals the truth. The advisor, the aid, the helper, our teacher, the tutor, the instructor, our coach, what he does. I want to really narrow down on this role. This role on how the Holy Spirit comes to do the ministry his ministry of convicting mankind of sin. So may the Lord bless you. Thank you, the Lord bless you. The Messiah is coming. Let us prepare the way. Let us be holy and righteous. Let us receive the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Amen. Blessed people, I spoke about the several roles and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church. In examining his role in the church, we see very clearly that we saw that the church was essentially designed in heaven by the Lord, and the Holy Spirit brought that program, that agenda of God, and deposited in the church. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit, one of the roles we saw. We saw very clearly that uh, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, then the church is finally empowered to go. 
to go and serve the mission of Christ, the Great Commission, to go and baptize all the nations that they may believe in Jesus, to baptize them in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Great Commission that they may convert the nations and fulfill the promise that the Lord gave Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, when he said he would bless him, there would be a great nation, and his descendants, that's all from the Hebrew line, and those who are grafted into the olive tree of God, all together as the sand of the seas, of the seashells. And then he says, through him he will now bless the nations, all the peoples of the earth. And that is the Christ. That is the mission he brought on the earth. That's the salvation he brought and the glory of Israel. And so we saw very clearly that the church is heavenly. The church was constructed in heaven. And the church has no business focusing on the earthly agenda at this hour. The church has to continue to focus on heaven and heaven and heaven alone. And as she does so, the Lord will always mitigate on the goings on here on the earth, will help her. The Lord is not out to humiliate her. He will be